This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Ali Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. We are going to have a special episode today. I'm very honored to have the guest of today's episode. He holds a PhD in exercise physiology and has worked for respectable 23 years as a lecturer in colleges and universities. He is a founder of Fitness Institute of Australia. He has been director of Australian College an online training organization. Nowadays, he describes himself as a sedentary lifestyle specialist. He is the creator of Need Fit Coaching Program that assists fitness professionals in developing lifestyle programs inclusive of physical activity for the ever-increasing sedentary population. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Dr. Paul Batman. Welcome, Paul, and thanks for taking time for this podcast. Uh, thanks very much for asking me, Only Absolute pleasure to be here and, and talk to you today about sedentary behavior. Yeah, great to have you here. So we will get soon to current pandemia situation in the world and its implication, but let's start a little bit further first. Um, so could you tell how did you get interested about sedentary behavior and non-exercise activity particles? Yeah, happy to, Ollie. I guess my story is a little bit different in as much that I've probably been involved in fitness now for more than 45 years. I started as soon as I went to teacher's college, starting to, studying to be a physical education teacher. Uh, and a few years ago, I was training to do a, a large trek and fell over and hurt my back. I went to the orthopedic surgeon, had my back fixed. I had to get a laminectomy to be done. And he informed me that he felt that there was something unusual about my heart and I should get it investigated. And having been involved in fitness for 40 years, I, I was shocked. I thought there's poss no possible way there could be anything wrong with my heart. Anyway, I went and had a cardiologist have a look at it and I found that my coronary calcium score was just out of this world, over 400. I investigated it further mm. and I had an artery, coronary artery that was 90% blocked that required a stent. And as you can imagine, after training so hard for so long, and I've always been an intense type trainer and very obsessed by it, uh, it blew me away. So I had to investigate it further to find out why that was. And as I was investigating my own situation, I started to find out that a lot of the problems with intense activity performed over a long period of time were very similar to the effects of sedentary people who had done nothing. So I imagine that mm. there was a, obviously a U-shaped curve somewhere here where there was a, a tipping point where too much exercise was bad for you. And my genes were good. Obviously, there were some things that may have contributed to it. But I do think that I was probably uh, subjected to a lot of oxidative stress, given that I came up through the era of intense exercise was the way to go. So I found mm. this really intriguing that there could be a tipping point where too much exercise was too bad for you and not enough exercise was too bad for you at the same time. So that sent me off looking at the sedentary behaviour uh, area and suddenly realised that um, being sedentary really wasn't the same as not exercising. And from that point on, I started to spend probably the last four or five years researching out the sedentary concept, looking for ways in which we could modify lifestyle and maybe make people healthier rather than improving VO2 at massive levels. And so that's where I ended up. I'm now looking at sedentary behaviour and I've tried to come up with some suggestions as to how we can reduce sedentary behaviour. Uh, whilst exercise prescription is important, I don't think enough emphasis is placed on reducing sedentary behaviour over the course of the day with multiple low to moderate intensity activities. Mm, yeah, no, that's that's very, very interesting story. And yeah, like you said, earlier the the knowledge was that you just do aerobic training and there was no talk about sedentary behavior so it must have come as a surprise for you yeah it certainly was so, Ollie. <laughs> yeah so you have developed this neat fit coaching program could you could you tell more about the program 
Yeah, happy to. Um, NEAT is, is an acronym that most of you would know is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. But my need is a little bit different. I think it's non-exercise activity transitions. So what I've attempted to, to, to do is mm. uh, look at how we've addressed sedentary behaviour in the past, particularly over the last four or five years, and found that there really isn't any niche there where we train people to reduce sedentary behaviour because the assumption is that if we do 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise a day and we follow that prescription, which is a great prescription, that it will immediately offset some of the insidious effects of sedentary behaviour. And so based on that, I decided to look at it in more detail and came up with the, the principle that I have of trying to look for inactive periods during a person's life and then try to substitute it with active periods based on if we take it to the nth degree on met minutes because I'm a real believer in mets, metabolic equivalents, I love them. And met minutes are a great mm. way to work out workloads. And it's not something that's used in the fitness industry much. It's used in testing quite often. Uh, so I tried to develop a program based on changing an activity by substituting with active ways. And then when people wanted to go a little bit further, then we look at workloads based on met minutes. Mm. Yeah. And so basically this is for medical and fitness professionals, how does it work? How, how, what can they do with this program? Okay, one of the things I've found, particularly I think in the current environment, is that there's just not enough information and knowledge about sedentary behaviour and sedentary lifestyles. And so uh, as much as I respect allied health professionals, the medical, um, certainly all the fitness professionals I've worked with for over 45 years, the knowledge base is still quite limited and what I've attempted to do is to get all that knowledge base together to provide information so that it extends their knowledge of what it is to be sedentary, making sure that they realise that being sedentary is not the same as too little exercise. And so with the Neat Fit program, it's basically mm. geared toward anyone in any health field, but the first two modules of it are very general and could be used pretty much by the community as well. So it, it is designed mm. essentially for professionals to understand sedentary behaviour more, to look at how it can be used in, um, and the neat fit can be used in weight loss if need be, or certainly weight management, and then look at some of the side effects of sedentary behaviour, look at the physiology of neat, and then look at uh, motivating sedentary populations because sedentary people are a lot different than the normal inactive group that we sometimes find in the gym. So it's a multifactorial program now produced mm. online, uh, mainly as an education base and also trying to identify recommendations of what we can do to identify sedentary behaviour and then replace it with more active alternatives. Mm. So very important information about sedentary behaviour there and very timely now during this, this pandemic. And is it correct that I understood that you are offering it now for free for a limited time? Yeah, it is. That's correct, Ollie. Um, we were hoping to launch the program in a month or so, but I think given the pandemic that we're faced with and the fact that we now have this, I guess we could call it self-isolation-induced sedentary lifestyles that have been imposed on us, uh, I thought it'd be really important mm. to try and get that message out there. So for the next three months... Uh, we are offering the Neat Fit program online free to anyone that wants to do it. The community, if they w want to know more about it, can do the first couple of modules and any allied health professional or medical or whoever can certainly complete the 10 full modules. It's quite an extensive program with over 300 pages of materials and about 12 hours worth of, uh, of, um, of um, audio visual stuff as well. So it, there's quite a bit in it. Yeah, that's that's really really good. So, could you tell where people can find it? Absolutely. If they go to www.neatfitcoaching.com, that'll give you the information here about what the Neat Fit concept is. And as you scroll down, it'll also tell you the different groups that it's been written for, and it'll give you an idea of what the ten modules are and all the learning um, aims and objectives that are in there as well. So if they go to that, they can see that. And if they look at it and find that it's something that they're interested in, if they go to admin at drumandeducation.com, then they will give mm. everyone that calls them or, or contacts them uh, 
um, a link to where they can get onto the program free of charge. Hmm. All right, great. So anyone interested, please check that out. So that's very relevant for the current situation that we are having a coronavirus pandemic globally and hundreds of millions of people are in a new situation in which people are advised to avoid social contact, stay home, and most of the gyms and exercise facilities are closed. So what implications do you see of this situation for health of people? I think the implications are huge, Oli. I think the longer that we're sedentary, particularly as the lockdown start to take effect, we could be faced with another pandemic after hopefully we beat the coronavirus. And I guess people don't realise that the WHO have said that there's somewhere between three to five million people every year die of diseases that are related to inactivity and sedentary lifestyles. And I think the last figures I saw in the UK and Europe was something like 600,000 people a year, uh, which makes it the fourth biggest killer uh, of any other activity, and it's rapidly approaching smoking. So I think we're already in a partial, uh, I won't say pandemic, but certainly an epidemic uh, that people just aren't really aware of to the extent that they possibly should. So as more people now go into lockdown, our gyms are closing, our fitness professionals are losing their jobs, we can only become more sedentary. So unless some changes are made to lifestyle, then that could escalate to even greater numbers and, and cause probably its own little pandemic. Mm, yeah. So if we if we think especially that <clears throat> the elderly people are in the risk groups and in many countries they are asked to stay home uh, on on different degrees and I think in UK for example this advice for already given for next three months so people will stay home for three months I think they are still allowed to go outside but probably their activity will decrease and especially sedentary behavior will will increase so what do you think will be the will be the effects to these elderly people in in different scenarios if they if they get some activity done if they don't do any and and so on yeah i think at the moment that probably and i'm one of these people now so i'm sort of talking from a bit of experience uh, i don't think older people 65 plus or 60 plus do enough activity anyway uh, a lot of them are retired and for some reason i think that retirement is a time to put up their feet and just relax when it really should be an opportunity to do more movement. So I think it'll only escalate a problem that's already there. And I don't think the fitness industry really has identified programs that specifically fit that age group because there was a study that was done in 2017 on the Australian fitness industry and they found that most of the programs that were run through the gym, something like 83% of those attended were under the age of 45 So the 55-plus group who were starting to become the most vulnerable, there probably was only about 6% of the Australian population that looked for any sort of fitness advice. And out of that, older men who tend to be those more at risk are even represented by a much smaller percentage of that. So there's not a lot of people at that age that are probably doing enough because they've not been told the correct things to do or alternatively the things that are on offer don't really fit for them. And I don't think the fitness industry at the moment is actually catering enough for them. So I think it'll only get worse. And I think it's one group where things could get a lot better by just giving them some simple instructions rather than trying to make them fit into a a fitness model. Mm, Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity, and energy expenditure. Furthermore, Fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light, moderate, and vigorous intensity. In addition to scientific accuracy, Fibian provides automatically produced and easy-to-understand reports for research participants. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com research. And how, how do you see it from the point of view of neuromuscular system that actually for elderly people, kind of strength training or some sort of strength training is important that they, they actually 
can maintain their muscle mass and and this is important for their independent living so how how do you see the situation from neuromuscular point of view and what what the elderly people can do in this special situation to keep up their neuromuscular abilities yeah i couldn't agree more Ali. i think the neuromuscular problems the sarcopenia and the osteopenia are absolutely critical to this group because of the independence and and possibly i think in the past we've looked more at too much aerobic uh, activity for them and at the same time possibly giving them training activities for strength that really don't fit what their capabilities are uh, one group that i've worked with in the past we do a thing called top of the hour and the top of the hour is that at the top of every hour um, the group that have uh, signed up for this type of program have to be doing something for five minutes every hour so that could be housework it could be walking it could be anything but they must be on their feet and they must be mobile so i found by doing that for five minutes at the top of the hour if they do that for sort of 12 hours during the day if it's possible to do it that long they can get a good four to six thousand steps within that and i think that in itself certainly helps them maintain their stability and their posture with their lower extremity and the other things we always encourage them to do if it's possible to do a resistance training program particularly with bands or with light weights or, or with any of the normal fitness things that's fantastic but if they don't we always encourage them to push and pull to lift and carry to twist to squat to stand to lunge in whatever activities they do so we're always asking them to do things with their arms in order to hold things and maintain it uh, because obviously the best prescription is a resistance training program but it's very difficult mm. particularly as they get older to to find an opportunity for them to do it and with now a lot of them do go to the gym and community centers just won't be able to get that effect so it, it is a difficult thing to do but i think we could make some lifestyle choices by creating more active homes for them uh, to encourage them mm. to do more activity yeah no th those were great points so if we go a little bit more specific with the tips now that how would you what kind of training program how do you get the resistance exercises done at home for people many of them don't have any any equipment home yeah that's correct uh the type of things that they need well first of all i think the critical thing is maintaining their body weight you know the the glute hamstring quad strength is really critical uh because it's great to be able to do the upper body stuff but if you can't maintain your body weight you can't move around it creates even more issues so as I said, what I encourage people mm -hmm. to do is to break up their sitting as much as possible. And, and this is something in your area, I'm sure. And by simply breaking up mm -hmm. sitting, you know, it's a hundred muscles that will contract just by simply moving from a sitting to a standing position and have them walking. It then creates this balance thing in your muscular balance. And I based it on um, studies that were done with NASA. And there's a great book by Joan Vanarkis, who was a NASA research scientist. And she looked at when, astronauts came back from space they showed significant aging as such so she drew, drew, drew the conclusion that aging and inactivity had similar effects the only thing with space flight you could overcome those problems with aging it's much more difficult so she found that by putting them to bed and getting the astronauts up every 15 minutes and walking for two minutes uh, and they did that eight to ten hours a day they responded much faster than giving them just a, a 30 minute or 60 minute exercise program so I based a lot of my stuff on the concept of space travel and how we can overcome some of the issues with that, which mimic um, aging to a much more significant degree. So what I would often do is I, I will look and see what the, the home life of the older adult is and then try and look at ways in which we can help them increase their strength simply by if they've got a dishwasher, pulling things out of the dishwasher and placing them in places. But rather than put them on a, on a bench, they have to reach up and put them in a much higher position. So rather than give a specific forearm curl, shoulder press thing, which is great if you can do it, but with some of these people, we have to look for ways in their day that we can make them reach, make them lift, make them carry, make them twist, make them lunge, that fits into the movements that they are normally familiar with. And, and it's been mm. quite successful. It works quite well. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. So so if we think that, uh, for example, now the guideline for these risk groups was to be self-isolating for three months, and it's probably 
a little bit difficult to do do those activities or they are not used so what would you say for people who think that all right i will just relax this three months and when this self-isolation stops i will get back to it what are the effects of of three months of increased sedentary behavior and decreased physical activity yeah i think they're very widespread and probably not publicly known to any significant degree ollie um I think this applies not just to older people but to everyone. And I think one of the issues that we're going to have even after the pandemic is getting people to become active again because if you look at, say, fitness centre members, you'll find that probably only 40% go to the fitness centre more than twice a week anyway. So there's 60% that actually don't go as often as they should. Now, if that's the case, I call them fringe dwellers. You know, the diehards will always go back. But the 60% fringe dwellers sadly, may very well do what you just said. They'll become sedentary and more sedentary. And when the opportunity comes to go back and improve their fitness, it's going to be very difficult for them to go back to where they came from. So it's almost a problem that is more widespread. It it covers the spectrum of all ages, I think, not just the older group. Uh, And the younger ones probably have more to lose than the older ones because they will rapidly decline, no question about it if they do choose to become those couch potatoes. So it's, I think it's a significant problem, not just now, but it will be later motivating those people to go back and maintain their exercise programs. Mm. So do you see that it's more about that actually their fitness is decreasing and then it will will be more difficult to get get again exercising or do you see it more as that you lose the habit and then it's difficult to create the habit again yeah now to be honest with you i think what we should do is look at ways of reducing sedentary time in our isolation rather than trying to maintain our level of fitness because i believe in equal energy expenditure Uh, i don't think things have to be intense uh, to get an effect from it if we can work out what the equivalent energy expenditure is. I had an example recently where a friend of mine was usually does 10,000 steps a day and can't do it because of the situation that they were in. So we looked at different things that they could do during the day. So we had um, 30 minutes of sweeping. They mowed the lawn for half an hour. Uh, they carried some activities around the garden. They raked the leaves. And we worked out what the energy expenditure was. I think it was about 380 calories for 10,000 steps. Uh, done over about 100 minutes. And then we looked at what we could do based on met minutes and energy equivalents of what they could do in their area. So I didn't think it mattered what they did, providing they burnt similar sort of calories and the energy expenditure was the same. And I've actually used this in a lot of the trekking things that I've done as well. And it worked out really well. Uh, so I, mm. I think it's not just a matter of going out there, lifting weights, getting on a bike, uh, getting on a treadmill. I think if we looked at energy equivalents, Uh, and maybe the ex-fizz people could do this as well, and we started matching one with the other, I think it could be just as effective so that when the time comes for them to go back to the gym or go back to the fitness activity, then they can work on their fitness. And whilst they might not increase the VO2 max to significant degrees by doing these lower intensity, more duration things, it has a specific effect on their metabolic qualities of muscle as well. So it can only enhance what they do when they do go back to the gym. So my thing is mm. that I think we should, during this pandemic period of self-isolation and just sedentary behaviour, we should look at reducing sedentary time. If we're able to do our moderate to vigorous physical activity stuff, we should. But my feeling mm. is that those that start it now in three months, a significant number won't be doing it and there'll be some that will never start it. So we have to find something. We've got to find a hook that people can jump on and do it and hold it for that period and then look for fitness after that. Fitness means many things to many people. It's not just, not just about a VO2 max improvement. So I'm all thinking right, so reduce you... sedentary time rather than try and spend all your time getting fit. One thing will work with the other. Mm, all right. So you see it more from the energy expenditure that the total energy expenditure is the important part and that you can achieve by by decreasing sedentary time. Am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. The thing that I like is I have a program I call Limit, and it's low intensity, moderate intensity transitions. And to my way of thinking, it's a bit like walking. We don't have to do 10,000 steps at any one time. We can do 10,000 steps over the course of a day 
by breaking it up into 10 little modules if need be to get to that point. So I think the movement from sitting to standing to walking is a really important transitional movement that should be done regularly during the day. So I think by doing that, we're more likely to get people uh, motivated to move rather than give them something that is enforced upon them. You know, it, people, I call it, the, it's, it's almost like an everything counts. Whatever you do, if you get off your chair and you do something, that's great. That's going to count towards something. A lot of people don't mm. think that. They think, no, I haven't, I've got to go to the gym or I have to lift a weight or I have to go hard on a bike. These are great things to do, but there's only a f- small proportion of the population that feel comfortable in doing those kind of things. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think even the just the act of standing up from a sitting position, it's it is a kind of a squat. And and yeah. especially if you look at like people who are quite active in their daily life, they they have a low sedentary behavior, they actually do quite many of those squats per day, like standing up, getting back down, standing up. So I I fully agree. How would you advise people like what what kind of advice you would give for people now in the self isolation? Uh, okay, I, I would think I, I would consider the top of the hour program I said before. Um, I, I guess mm. my recommendations would be if, at least every hour try and walk for five minutes. Now that's going to give them a hundred to two hundred steps. If they do that multiple times during the day, they're going to get a lot of steps up in an intermittent fashion, and at the same time, they're going to get at least twelve to fifteen squats in there as well. So I think that's that's incorrect. That that's important. The other thing is I really like the concept of intermittent walking. I call them global roamers. Uh, they walk, and it's where will my feet take me today? Really, that's the message that's coming out. You don't have to do it all at once. Break it up and do it at different times because. Like you, I recognize the importance of moving from a seated position to a standing position, moving, but at some stage going back to sitting. Sitting's not the issue, it's prolonged sitting. So we could reduce our sitting by maybe two to two and a half hours a day. That would go hugely toward making these people much more active and it's doable. Everything has to be doable in this environment. So I would recommend that. Uh, I also recommend looking at things that we do in the house um, that will allow us to do it from a standing position. If we're going to cook meals, and obviously we stand, and even if we stand during the eating as well, or stand while we're cleaning up or do whatever. And I think it's a great opportunity, given we've got this virus and the virus sits on everything basically in our house, is that we could substitute a lot of the physical activity we do outside our house to keeping our house pristine clean. I must admit, since we lost our housekeeper, I've never worked so hard cleaning my house. So I think there's a significant lesson to learn there. So if we look at all the inactive things that we do in our house and then try and substitute them with an active alternative, by doing that, I think we'd be astounded at the amount of time we would be moving, certainly above two mets, which is important. We've got to stop people from doing a one met. We've got to get to two mets to three mets. We don't have to get to nine mets. But if we get two to three mets to four mets consistently, intermittently throughout the day, that's a huge energy expenditure, really. We could get, you know, a thousand calories by just doing all these different things during that day. And that's where I think the message has to come from. We have to do things that are that are doable. We have to fit it into the lifestyle that we've put been put into and not try and create outside activities inside. Because I think it's going to be fraught with danger, particularly with older age groups and with the 60% of people that only go to the gym a couple of times of the week anyway. The gym is fantastic and I've lived in gyms most of my life and I'm desperate to go back. But I'm also a realist to know that there are some people that it just won't fit for. So we have to, it's got to be a massive lifestyle change in the confines of their house, garden, garage, inside, whatever, to try and create that active active alternative all day or as much of the day as possible mm. so basically these guidelines that you say is is especially people who don't exercise and haven't used to it but you'd still still encourage people who go to the gym who do the uh, more intensive workouts to keep keep doing them yeah i think if you look at some of the good research out there the 
a lot of a lot of researchers have actually coined this type term, which is the active couch potato, basically, or the active the the um, active non exerciser, the inactive exerciser, etc. And I think it's been shown that even if you do your thirty to sixty minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise, which is super super important and the cornerstone for everything we do. It still doesn't attenuate the problems of the extra 10 hours that that person has the potential to sit for. So I would love to see, and I hope it will happen in my lifetime, is that we will recognise the need to be active exercisers. Let's reduce sedentary time by making our lives more active because theoretically over the last 40 years, that low to moderate intensity transition thing has been taken out of our lives because of the digital revolution, all the automation that's gone on. And imagine if we combine that with going to the gym and doing our activity, we would be an active exerciser. And the research shows that they are the healthiest and they're the ones that live the longest. Combine those two together rather than be an inactive exerciser and an active non-exerciser. Bring them all together. So that, that's what I hope that will ultimately come, perhaps come out of this as more people understand the sedentary thing and they're also doing the active thing. Wow, how could we combine those together? That would be fantastic active exercise, a way to go. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Fibian is an accurate sitting and physical activity tracking device and analysis platform. It is a great tool for projects that aim for behavior change in sedentary behavior and incidental physical activity. Fibian provides easy to understand PDF and web browser reports for participants. Other features include comparisons to recommendations, linking results to health risks, achievement cards, and interactive goal-setting tool. In addition, Fibian provides an API that allows for easy integration to other systems and applications. Learn more about Fibian at fibian.com research. Fibian. From researchers to researchers. And then a little bit of, of speculation that uh, we don't know much about how this about this virus, but I think the experts have said that there will probably be many waves of of these uh, infections. That when we have the restrictions, we will at the some point get it down. Then when we release them, it will probably come again, and so on. So there's there's quite a big chance that people will get it at some point. So how, how do you see that? That I think there's a knowledge that, for example, from a major surgery, your VO2 max predicts that whether you will survive the surgery and this COVID-19 is affecting your lungs, which is, which is one part of our aerobic exercise system in a way. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the maximum VO2 makes a difference whether you survive the the COVID-19, if you get it? Uh, I mean, I've always been a VO2 max guy. I love VO2 max. Uh, but I think realistically, most of the research shows us that, and, and this is borne out in a lot of the ACSM stuff, is that the biggest increase in health occurs from people that are totally inactive to moderately active or average fitness. Uh, to go from average to a little bit further, there's obviously another increase. But as soon as you start going beyond that, as VO2 max improves and if it, if it becomes more intensity, intensity dependent, then that's where the immune system can actually turn against you. And that's what I found in my own case, that if you do too much of the higher intensity stuff, if your emphasis is on VO2 max, then there can be oxidative stress. There can be free radical reactive oxygen species that can't be sopped up. And there is a potential damage to cell membranes. So I love VO2 max. I understand the concept of it. But the fitter you are, the harder you have to go. And I think if you're, you're being in this environment, going too hard too early could actually cause an immunosuppressing effect rather than an immunoenhancing effect on that immune system. So I'm thinking that I still think that it's an energy equivalent thing. I think that, you know, marathoners don't necessarily have to have high VO2 maxes. They can have high lactate thresholds, uh, which is based more on a duration rather than an intensity. I think I'm going to be a marathon runner. I, I think I'm going to try and keep my VO2 max at a good level, but I'm going to try and build up things so I have less reliance on my anaerobic system uh, or the contribution mm -hmm. of that anaerobic system to make me more aerobic. 
So I think it sounds great in theory to have a high VO2 max and you will live longer, but I think the process of getting there could create issues that might not be as we see them. So in, in this situation, the immune system is important in, in getting the infections. So would you advise against really vigorous intensity activity for people who are not used to it? Oh, without question, I would. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that anyway. I think uh, intensity is fantastic. I love doing hit classes and I do them as regularly as I can. But the realisation is that if you're an unfit person, and you're doing more high intensity activity, you've got to think about that dose response curve. The high intensity activity will cause a lot more fatigue, which means that it creates a longer recovery period, which means you can't do it as often. If you want an overcompensation from that one training activity, it could be 72, could be 48, 72, 86 hours before you get the overcompensation, which is what you want to build upon with your next training activity. So it's the injudicious use of intensity that's the problem, I think. So if you're unfit and you're trying to exercise hard every day, I really think that over the course of a period of time, particularly in the environment they're in, there is the potential to do more harm than good. Mm. And and of course, we need to remember that the training window is very big when you are unfit. So basically, very small stimuli will yep. will improve the fitness and then you can build progressively on that so how how little is is enough for people who have been sedentary that they actually get the stimuli to improve yeah well i think the uh that who i recommend that you do and i'm talking minutes now because that's basically what a lot of them do is they're talking about 500 to a thousand met minutes which is probably equivalent to the 150 minutes per week, which is 30 minutes per day. Uh, and that 30 minutes per day doesn't necessarily have to be done at any one time. I think we're now able to do it in 10-minute bouts. I personally think you can do it in less than 10-minute bouts, but uh, the recommendations are 10-minute bouts of exercise three times a day, three 10 minutes will get you to that level from being totally inactive that will build up your aerobic fitness to, to be more below average or average, and you'll get significant health benefits from that. And as you said, as you become fitter, then you can start introducing more of the intense activity and then improve your VO to max from that point. But the trouble is if we do intense activity too early with these people, I think it's going to backfire on us. Let's look at changing lifestyles. Let's look at multiple mm. movements during the day. And I think that 500 to 1,000 minutes is great, but it's interesting because I saw a meta-analysis not long ago and it was quite extensive, a number of studies looking at dose response. And their suggestion was that different diseases have different doses. So, for example, they were talking about um, if you really look at trying to do a, a shotgun effect to get as many diseases within your scope as possible, you need to do between 3,000 to 4,000 met minutes. And three to 4,000 met minutes is, you know, three to five times what the current recommendation is. So if the current recommendation is 500 to 1,000 met minutes, which is equivalent to about 150 minutes per week, you can see that three to 4,000 is really quite extensive. So some of the activities, and I, I'm just trying to think of them offhand, I think breast cancer was one they looked at and found that if you did, say, 600 to 1,000 mets, that was probably about a 3% improvement in your chance of uh, um, overcoming breast cancer. But if you went up to nearly 8,000, there was a 6% increase. So it wasn't a lot in the likes of breast cancer, but there was significant in diabetes. And it said that you know, diabetes, if you did about the 600 to uh, 1,500 minutes, that was about, a, I think it was about a 14% improvement. But if you went up to six or 7,000 minutes, you could get a 23% improvement. So what I think what we're seeing is that it's again the energy equivalent energy expenditure thing. We have to do more of low to moderate stuff intermittently over the course of the day to try and get these met minutes and these workloads up to have a significant effect on some of these chronic diseases that we're trying to overcome. So I think it would be very naive of us to think that if we just do 30 minutes a day uh, and that's all we did and we did it three or four times a week, we will improve our cardiovascular fitness and we will certainly improve our ability to live longer and possibly live better. But the reality is that it's like any sort of prescription. Different chronic diseases require different prescriptions. 
And we can't do it via intensity, so we have to do it through lifestyle changes that allow us to move two to three, four, five, six Mets at different times during the day. It's like building up a bank account. We kind of build these Met minutes up and try and attract uh, the responses we want to overcome some of these chronic diseases that we're confronted with. Mm. And and could you tell to the listeners that uh, what kind of diseases you can actually prevent with just avoiding sedentary behavior or decreasing sedentary behavior time? Yeah, the, well, there's a heap of them, <laughs> that's for sure, Ollie. There is a thing called the inactivity wheel that people can look at. And basically, inactivity has an effect on every system in the body. So from a cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory point of view, obviously we, get, we've got, we can have hypertension, we can get congestive heart failure. The one that intrigues me is the endothelial dysfunction. You know, one thing I've found is that there's nitric oxide involvement with endothelial function and sedentary activity and excessive exercise have an effect on nitric oxide production, which is, affects the way the artery itself contracts uh, and also Um, dilate. So the vasoconstriction, the vasodilation is affected by this nitric oxide thing. So in the sedentary period, the, the, the nitric oxide can be affected, just to give an example of it. The other thing is that you can, you know, you suffer from sarcopenia, obviously, and, and disuse. There's also the concept of um, of brain activity as well. As we become more sedentary, we become less sensitive to moving signals. The neurochemicals don't appear to act exactly the same way on an active brain compared to a sedentary brain. So that's an interesting one in itself. So we kind of form a sedentary structure in the way we think about things. So it's not just our body that becomes or our muscles become sedentary, but even the neural pathways within our brain also become sedentary. So there's a brain function activity there. And even simple things like stabilizer muscles, uh, you know, we've all gone through the planking thing to try and increase our pelvic stability. When we become sedentary and we sit and we lounge and we do things less than one met or one font five mets, whatever it is that we're sitting on or encased in is now stabilizing our entire body. Um, I always say that my biggest fear is losing strength in my glute, my hamstrings and my and my quads. Uh, so I, I spend as much time on my feet as possible given I'm scared I'm going to lose the strength in those areas. So the stabilizer muscles are important. Uh, and because of that, The stabilized muscles hold the, the origins of muscles together, which means that the other muscles that are going to cause the movement to mobilize the muscles don't have a firm base on which to pull. So if the origin of insertion of muscle comes together, the efficiency of the muscle contracts in this much less as well. And that's not even taking into account things like LPL enzymes, which are responsible for converting triglycerides to fatty acids that can then be taken into the muscle cell. An interesting study And I'm sure a lot of your listeners would be aware of Mark Hamilton, who is a, a massive researcher when it comes to sitting, coined the term inactive physiology, etc. And his research is mainly on that lipoprotein lipose enzyme. And he find, found that if you were to sit for long periods, the LPL enzyme uh, becomes dormant. You can go and do your moderate to vigorous exercise, but it will still be dormant. That enzyme has to be woken up periodically during the course of every hour to ensure that it fulfills its function of being the vacuum cleaner of the, the blood, if you like, by converting the triglyceride into a fatty acid so the fatty acid can be taken into the muscle. So when you start looking at some of these effects, they're really quite widespread. And one that really interests me is this thing on mechanotransduction. I remember a couple of years ago, I took my grandkids to SeaWorld. And one thing I noticed, and it was accentuated in a study I read, which was the orca whales. They all have a bent over dorsal fin. I don't know whether you've ever seen it, but the dorsal fin is bent and it's not like the orca whales that we find in the wild. And part of the reason for it is that they swim in the same direction all the time. They're fed food so they don't have to move up and down and move in different directions. Um, and they swim in a, 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 in a pool that's really quite shallow. So they're actually constricted in what they do. And it's not unlike what we do. We sit in a chair, we lay in a lounge, and we're going to do it more so now. Uh, we're going to watch Netflix or whatever it might be We're going to reduce the amount of movement and we're going to find that we could end up with that flaccid fin syndrome concept where muscles will just atrophy because they're just not doing enough. We're confining ourselves. Mm. To me, the cell membrane, the cell has to be pushed like a sponge. It's got to be pushed in all different directions. We do it in fitness. We just don't do a shoulder press. We do all different types of shoulder press. We change grips. We change position. We change angles. So we realize it's important mm. for that. It's got to be just as important in everyday activity as well. 
So it just, these problems start snowballing, mitochondrial distress, you know, the mitochondria doesn't fulfill its function. It starts to leak free radicals. The reaction oxygen species start to increase. We get mild inflammation throughout our body. So inactive people suffer from this mild chronic inflammation that makes the immune system hyperactive right from the start, unable to fulfill its function when it really needs to fight something like, uh, like a, you know, coronavirus or something similar. So I, I don't know if we're aware of all these side effects of this sedentary lifestyle that we're about to be thrust into. And, and hopefully, you know, people will want to find out more information about it. Yeah, yeah, there was very many, many, many very interesting things. And and you said about the LPL enzyme. So you said about periodical wake up. Could you tell yep. more about how do you wake up this enzyme in, in the muscle? Yeah, I think most of the most of the information that's out there, people will probably support the fact that a lot of the sedentary problems that I've just spoken about are the result of limited muscle contraction. I don't think we can ever place enough emphasis on a muscle contraction and multiple muscle contractions all through our day and through our month and through our life. And the LPL enzyme mm. is one of those enzymes that if the muscle is dormant for a period of time, it realizes that it doesn't really have to fulfill its function. So it will go to sleep just as the muscle will go to sleep, basically. So as the muscle becomes dormant, so does the enzyme. Because the muscle is not contracting and forcing the enzyme to wake up, convert triglycerides into free fatty acids and putting it into the muscle because the muscle doesn't want it either. So the suggestion is mm. that maybe every 20 minutes or 30 minutes, what you have to do is activate that LPL enzyme. And that's simply a sitting to standing to moving thing. Uh, and the suggestion is perhaps even two minutes every 30 minutes. I think five minutes every hour if people can't do two minutes every 30 minutes. That will wake up that enzyme mm. to fulfill its function. And one thing goes with another. All these conditions that we've briefly touched upon just in the last 10 minutes or so are all to do with reduced muscle contraction. You just can't place enough emphasis. It can't be just a 30-minute, 60-minute muscle contraction. That's great for cardiovascular. It can be great for metabolic. But there are other factors within the muscle that need to be stimulated long term over a long period of time in a rest in a rest activity rest activity. It's almost like an interval training program, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So basically, you're saying that you can kind of wake up your muscle metabolism by by standing, moving two minutes every half an hour, or five minutes every hour if you can't do every half an hour yeah i think that's the bait if we could get that message across to people uh you know they don't have to be great athletes to get benefits from movement they just have to change mm. their lifestyle i think as a basis of anything if we were to tell people that that would be a significant start to overcoming some of the problems associated with sedentary lifestyle and particularly with the aging because older people have a, a double whammy really they've got the inactivity things, sedentary lifestyle problems, and they've got the aging problems as well. And often one exacerbates the other. So I, I think that'd be a great start. And that's why I think, you know, the sitting thing, like you, I know you think the same way. The, the sitting activity is, I don't think it can be overestimated. I think it is a real mm. issue. Also, you mentioned the sedentary brain. Could you, could you explain more what, what is sedentary brain? Yeah, I think there's. I think, as I said before, that there is. Um, there's actually a great diagram that shows you uh, the sedentary brain and shows you the active brain. There's really quite, you know, differences in them. And I think with neuroplasticity, the fact that the brain can change, you can inc increase obviously the neurons and the way we do things. And the suggestion I've heard is that and read about is that physical inactivity in and of itself. Because the muscles themselves are now in inactive state, uh, the signaling to the muscle and the feedback from the muscle to the brain can also be affected from it. So the neural pathways, like most things, if they're not being used, can also go into hibernation. And I think there was one, there was one study I did read about a Rexon, which was uh, in rodent studies, and they found that um, if they an Rexon itself, it's a transmitter and it, it actually stimulates movement. So in rodents, the orexin was uh, injected into the rodents and the rodents became f much more hyperactive, uh, which then encouraged mm. them to move more. So their whole lifestyle changed because of this neurotransmitter. And the assumption was that 
because of the orexin itself, if it's taken away, it actually causes the opposite effect. So the brain activities, the suggestion is the neural pathways will change as well as the neurotransmitters. And I, there was one article I have spent time on which looked at um, dementia. And whilst we think the neural pathways are important, which they are obviously, and the way in which the brain forms, is that one suggestion was it could also have something to do with the cardiac output. So as we get older, if our heart becomes much more rigid, our arteries become rigid, then the blood flow to the brain itself will be reduced. So if we've got hardening of the arteries, the, the carotid arteries going to the brain as well as the, the various vessels that supply the brain, and if the heart stops pumping as efficiently as it used to, then the blood flow to those areas will exacerbate the problem. So the suggestion was that if we had older people or younger people as they become older, they become more active, they improve their stroke volume and cardiac output, they increase their blood flow to the brain and to other parts of the body itself, they do reduce the plaque buildup, then perhaps that will have a favourable effect if at some stage they're predisposed to some sort of dementia or, or um, anything related to memory loss. So I thought that's quite interesting too. So if we can get people to become more active, create those cardiovascular effects, then it may very well have an effect on the way in which the brain responds uh, eventually as time goes on to memory loss and perhaps even to, to dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever it might be. So I think the brain concept is a good one. I quite like it. Uh, and I think that physical activity can only enhance um, a lot of those issues and improve the brain's ability to uh, function normally and, and encourage that neuroplasticity. Yeah, I, I think those are coming up. It is now a lot of research emerging about the relationship between sedentary behavior, physical activity and and the brain. Have, have you heard about that some researchers coined the term type 3 diabetes that actually I think it was the Alzheimer's disease that that would be the diabetes in the brain. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, no, I haven't heard it, Ollie, no. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just heard about it now. I think it's not widely accepted yet, but I think it was really interesting that it would actually be like the insulin resistance within the brain, that it's kind of uh, energy problem uh, in the brain. And this kind of links to your you're saying that dementia could be that you don't get enough blood blood in the brain so it also causes that you don't have enough enough energy to be produced in the in the brain so i think it's it's really interesting study it certainly makes a lot certainly makes a lot of sense this podcast is sponsored by fibian my name is uh, taria jövog i'm associate professor at oslo metropolitan university currently i'm using fibian in a project where we investigate activities of daily life in people with a lower limb amputation. My impression is that Fibion is easy to implement in this project. It's easy to use and it's also simple to upload and analyze the data. And, and you said about that uh, the cardiac output effects because the arteries come more rigid and there's a uh, a lot of effects like endothelial effects. Could you tell more about those in relation to sedentary behavior? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, as I said, from my experience now, I've got um, basically I've been diagnosed with coronary artery disease, uh, which it's really hard for me to accept given that I've been exercising for nearly 50 years. Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, particularly in really active people, the coronary calcium scores tend to be much higher. And I think it's been shown that in 30 or 40% of marathon runners, their coronary calcium scores are higher, which probably indicates that they've had inflammation within the arterial walls that's actually caused the hardening of the artery with a calcium buildup. Uh, but the good news, supposedly, is that the calcium itself, as it builds up and creates the plaque, the plaque is of a different density, so it's unlikely to break off and clog up anything else. But it still does cause a reduction in the blood flow to that area, and it still does cause an inhibition in that vasoconstriction or vasodilation necessary for the artery to assist with the control of blood pressure. So 
this condition with sedentary people is very similar to those that over-exercise. So as we get older or as we become less active, if our stroke volume decreases to a significant degree, then obviously our cardiac output will. And one of the things I've seen is that if you exercise the heart too much, it causes micro tears within it. As part of the healing process, if scar tissue builds up, the heart itself does become less able to pump as effectively as it should. And, and that's one of the things that happens with sedentary lifestyles, it happens with ageing, and it happens with intense exercise. So there's kind of a trifecta going on there. So in that instance, then uh, as stroke volume decreases, cardiac output decreases, uh, nitric oxide changes occur within the endothelial walls, there's potential laying down of more calcium, there's an inflammation response that goes, the immune system will then send macrophages and perhaps neutrophils to that area to repair anything that's occurred that they think is of danger within the arterial wall and they start to reinforce it. And as they start to reinforce it, then the pliability of the arteries is, is decreased significantly, which can ultimately uh, then move to hypertension, high blood pressure and other conditions. So it, it's a bit of a combination of a whole yeah. range of different factors that come together. Yeah, so too little or too much is is not good for you. How much do you think is too much for the heart and the arteries? That where is the limit? That what is too much exercise? Uh, only if I, I wish I knew that question. I, I guess I really don't know to be honest. I can only go by what giants before me have, have suggested, and I have read a lot on because my my background was in running, so I ran, you know, probably eighty to one hundred k for thirty five years. And I think that's it, it sort of came back to bite me mm. a bit now as I've gone on. I, I've excessively, uh, I did it. Uh, but I think, you know, there, were the, there was a Copenhagen study, I think, that was done. And ACSM have come out. I think even Stephen Blair has also come out and suggested that around 30 kilometres a week is really enough for running. And I remember seeing or hearing something where if you looked at those that did, 30, if we take running, for example, those that did 30 kilometres and those that did 50 kilometres, then the ones that did nothing, and the ones that did 50K plus were the ones that were more at risk than the, those, those that did the moderate activity, which is 30 kilometres. So, you know, suggestion is maybe you can go up to maybe 40 or 50 kilometres running, uh, maybe 60 kilometres walking, but I guess that tipping point is still under question. We really don't know what that is. And from my own perspective, I just know that I did too much for too long and my body started to work against me. So I'm very much in the over-exercising area, if you like. So it's kind of interesting that we've got that U-curve happening where under and over demonstrates similar types of um, conditions and problems. So it would be fantastic if we knew where that tipping point was. But I guess that's where research needs to head. What is the optimum dose? Mm. So even 50 kilometers of running per week showed that there was uh, it was better with uh, less active. And what, what were the variables they were looking? Do you remember? I, I, too, I can't remember offhand at the moment. I'd have to go back to the study itself, Ollie. I was just more concerned with the, um, uh, particularly the coronary cardiac, the coronary calcium scores were the thing that I was looking at. And the suggestion was that, you know, they, they, they can be quite low up to 30K, but they start to escalate from 50K on. And, you know, it's, I've had stress tests in the past and, you know, I can do 15 minutes, not a problem. So my condition was never picked up. Uh, I just come back from a really heavy trek, uh, one of the top 10 treks in the world with the 90% blocked artery and knew nothing of it until I fell over and hurt myself and, and then I had to get it done. So it's one of those things that, I've had obviously a high coronary calcium score for a long time. It's 400 plus, so that, that's quite heavy. Uh, and I've been able to function mm. at a high level, even for my age, for a long period of time. But I guess there would have come a time when I wouldn't have been able to and who knows where I could have ended up with it. So I'm just now really cognizant of the fact that uh, intensity long term without good recovery is not the answer uh, to good levels of health and fitness. I think we've got to look inside and particularly given from 1990 to now in the last you know, 30 years, whatever it is, how computers have taken over our lives, uh, smartphones, et cetera, the 
we've lost about you know anywhere between 150 to 400 calories a day just in energy expenditure because we're more inactive. And what's happened in my lifetime mm. is that when I started in fitness, we had an active lifestyle and we went to do fitness activities and everything was good. But in the last few years, our lifestyles have become more inactive and our fitness activities have tried to take over and compensate for the sedentary periods that we're now experiencing. And as the research starts to develop, I think they'll find that one doesn't necessarily match the other. And it's interesting, I, I looked at the um, URSA study recently on penetration rates to see what countries in the world uh, were more into fitness than other countries based on uh, fitness centre membership. And the highest ones were, were countries in your area, you know, the, the Denmarks, the Swedens, the Norways, the Finland, all those had, you know, 20% 20, 20 plus penetration rates. And then there was an outlier, which was the US that had about 22%. But in all the countries, the top five countries that had the highest penetration rates in fitness, they also had the lowest sedentary rates and the lowest obesity rates, except the US, which had high penetration rates, but had really high obesity rates and really high sedentary rates. Those countries from five to six, and Australia is one of them, had um, seven, 15, 16, 70 percent penetration rates, which is, means there's still a lot of people that aren't going to the gym, but they're starting to get increased um, obesity, increased sedentary times. So the message that I saw from that is that if you lead an active lifestyle and you take it to fitness, then you're really getting all the benefits. You're becoming that active exerciser that we want everyone to become. So never underestimate mm. the power of a lifestyle and the impact that it has on your health in combination with your fitness prescription. Mm, yeah. And, and then earlier you mentioned about the chronic inflammation, which is, I think, really, really interesting theme. So could you, could you tell more about the sedentary behavior and its relation to chronic inflammation? Yeah, certainly. I guess one of the things that I've really been interested in is um, mitochondrial response to different types of exercise. And, you know, the mitochondria, I guess, being the powerhouse of the cell, um, is responsible for consuming the oxygen, burning the fuel, releasing the energy for the remake of ATP. So the oxygen intake into that mitochondria becomes really critical. And we know that mitochondria is a bit like a factory, I guess, if if we create a response within the mitochondria uh, within the muscle itself to consume more oxygen, then the mitochondria will get a little bit bigger. It'll put more enzymes on board, if you like, and then hopefully, as time goes on, may become more mitochondria. So you get a mitochondrial increase in density and in number. Uh, so in a detraining state, mm. it's probably one of the things that you lose at less. So if you're trained up and you then decide to stop training. During the detraining process, if you decrease your blood volume, you then decrease your stroke volume, you then increase, decrease your cardiac output, the biggest losses in VO2 max are generally central, central responses. Uh, of things that probably mm. that you hold on to a little bit longer will be your blood volume changes, you know, your hemoglobin changes and your mitochondrial changes. So the mitochondria is really important, and I always think it's like a factory. If you've got a business and you're manufacturing something and the business is doing well, then you put more factories on, put more people on, which are kind of like enzymes, mm -hmm. and then you make more factories, which are kind of like the mitochondria. But the opposite will also happen. So the more sedentary you become, the less muscle activity that goes on, the body will start to realise that there's less need to have all those enzymes on the faults of the mitochondria, probably less need to have as many mitochondria. So they'll have a limited amount of mitochondria doing a maximum amount of work because the work itself has been reduced. So in a sedentary state, as the mitochondria, a bit like the LPL enzyme, becomes less active, um, it also starts to, from what I understand, start to leak um, reactive oxygen species. So it's a bit like if you've got a, a, a mitochondria and you exercise very hard, the oxygen that goes into the mitochondria to produce the energy, et cetera, burn the fuel, release the energy, et cetera, um, the reactive oxygen species that come from that have to be sopped up. Now, if there's any leakage of that, then it will create an immune response. Uh, it will create um, a, an immune response. So the immune system then will become hyper hyperactive and you institute this inflammatory response. And it happens in obese people. For my way of thinking, if you get an mm. obese person and you train them excessively hard to try and burn more calories, 
then you magnify their inflammatory response because they are already in an inflammatory um, situation. The adipocytes themselves, that's what they do. They release certain hormones from the cells themselves that will activate the immune system to produce um, a mild inflammation. They call it a metaflammation, a mild inflammation response. And that inflammation response is mm. then picked up by all the tissues in the body that also become inflamed. And then once that occurs, as we said before, it causes a hypervigilant immune system response. And then once that happens, it wears the immune system down. So if you'd imagine we're training hard, we're unfit, we're overweight, we're training hard in the, in the environment that we're in, we're trying to stimulate the immune system. But in fact, if we were to push the mitochondria beyond what its capabilities are, and we then have a reactive oxygen species um, response where we can't sop it up or we can't neutralize it, then that inflammatory response will then become greater in those people and potentially cause an immunosuppressing effect rather than an immunoenhancing effect. So that's my worry is that, you know, I love mitochondria so much. I want it looked after and I want it to be maintained. And I want it to be nurtured. I don't want it to be abused. Uh, and so in, an, in an, an untrained state, we abuse it. And in a super trained state, we also abuse it if we don't do things either way. I think the untrained person needs to just be more moderately active and the overtrained person needs to be less active with more recovery. Mm. All right, that, that's that's very interesting. So so for the inflammation, I try to understand. So you, you're saying that for the unfit and overweight person, if they do too hard training, they get more inflammation. But but how do you see it? I think I have heard somewhere that actually kind of the inflammation from the training is kind of good practice against the low grade inflammation. Mm. Uh, could could you explain? I'm I'm a little bit lost here. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I think if if we look at we look at athletes themselves, you know the the concept of an athlete working hard has to have significant recovery to utilize mm. the intensity in a positive way. If the intensity mm. itself creates a situation or will create significant fatigue and the fatigue itself is not compensated for, then the next training session, the athlete will start during the recovery period and won't start at the overcompensation because the training curve requires a tolerating effect, requires fatigue, it requires recovery. Mm. But it re what we're looking for is interest on our investment, you know, and the interest on the investment is the overcompensation. If we don't get to the overcompensation and we start training hard as we climb the recovery curve, we get into that overreaching or overtraining state. And as we get into that overtraining yeah. state and we create more inflammation within our tissues that will require more recovery and we're not giving it that recovery, and then that's when they get colds, they start to be susceptible to flu, you know, they're isolated because of the immune system response they have from it. So I'm just suggesting that what we need to do is be we vigilant. Now, I think we should do intensity stuff, no question about it, but we have to make sure mm. we have adequate recovery for it. And the less fit people have greater depth of fatigue and take longer time to recover. So if you can imagine a curve that has a toleration, which is a flat line, and then you go down in recovery, mm. And then you come up, oh, sorry, fatigue, then you come up in recovery, then you get your overcompensation. That's the curve we want. But if we've got a toleration, mm -hmm. we drop the fatigue, but because we're unfit to fit, and overweight, the fatigue is greater. The recovery curve instead of vertical becomes horizontal, which means it then takes longer to get the overcompensation before we should be doing the next training session. Because training sessions themselves, the most effective ones, the second training session starts in the overcompensation. It doesn't necessarily mm. start as you're climbing the fatigue curve if you want to get maximum benefit from it. And th that's mm. where I'm suggesting that if we train people too hard too early, then we're training them to the point where we're training them, the second training or third training session will be whilst they're climbing that fatigue curve rather than at the peak of their overcompensation. Because the mm. overcompensation right. is where the training effect is occurring and you're training them while they're still recovering from it. So the more unfit people have a longer, you know, they have a flattened recovery curve and that's why they, they can easily go into an overtraining state. And my suggestion is why, why do we want to do that? Why put them in that position to start with? Why not use the low to moderate intensity stuff over a period of time? Create all these nice effects within mitochondria, blood flow, muscle contraction, etc., and then slowly add intensity to it a little bit later. 
And that's my suggestion. I'm, I'm concerned about and have been in the past where we get overweight people being subjected to high intensity interval training to lose weight. And they invariably over a period of time, once they lose the weight, they put it back on, they rebound back on it. So I, mm. there's a lot of factors within that that kind of need to be considered. And I keep coming back to let's reduce the entry behavior to start with and worry about the other things a little bit later. Do things that are within mm, the no, scope no. of what we can do and what our body's capable of adjusting to and recovering from. Yeah, now now I got so basically your idea is that if you do if you are unfit and you do hard training sessions, probably you don't have enough time to recover. It's much better to do the less intensive trainings yep. more often. I think so, yeah. It comes back to the thing we talked about earlier, which is the equivalent energy expenditure. To me, at the end of the day, it's not whether you go hard or you go long. It's that you have to make sure that you've produced the energy required to get the effect. And the effect doesn't have to always be intense. The effect doesn't always have to be long or frequency. You know, you've got frequency, intensity, duration. They're multifactorial things that need to be brought in together. And I just see, and I guess I'm biased now because I've seen this from myself, is that we have to be really careful with some groups doing too much of the high intensity activity. We, we still need to draw the difference between being sedentary is not the same as not exercising. I, I think they're quite different. So if we're gonna go the exercise route, mm. then obviously we've always been, we've been told this from forever, that we start off slow, we do progressive overload, and eventually we build upon responses that we've previously gained from our previous training activity. And then on the other side of it, so we have to reduce sedentary time, make people more active by doing more multiple contractions during the day, start thinking about all those, you know, sarcopenia, brain function, mitochondria, LPL things, and combine them all together. And once we do that, my, I think we've got a terrific combination because basically, you know, we've had this body for, what, 150,000 years, and it's evolved based on multiple movements during the course of the day, and that's what, particularly over the last 30 years, we've taken away. So we can't substitute it for something mm. that's not the same. You know, specificity of fitness. If low to moderate intensity stuff, multiple activities have been taken away from you during the course of the day, then if specificity of fitness says that you do something, get a specific response, that's what you've got to bring back into your life and then combine it with the other stuff that we do. One can't substitute for the other. I mean, most of the research says, and you mm. know this probably better than I do, that from the sitting perspective, if you're going to do activity itself physical activity it's got to be of a higher intensity for a longer duration but if you do that for people that are super inactive then you go back to what we said before the fatigue curve is too long the recovery curve is too flat so they're quite easy for those people to get into that that overtraining state and then we talked about the sitting mm. thing take the lpl enzyme that intense activity is not going to improve the lpl enzyme we're going to have to break sitting up or sedentary periods up during the course of the day and add it to whatever we do, you know. So it's a combination of many different activities. I think if we really want to optimise what we've got, you know, a lot of people think, what's the minimum amount of activity I could do to get the benefits? I always say, what's the optimum you can do to get those benefits? Mm. Yeah, I, I I fully agree. It, it makes all the all the sense. So it has been really interesting discussions on on many aspects of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and its relation to current situation in the world. Is there something you would still like to to add in the discussion? Uh, all, I guess all I'd like to finish with, Ollie, is that I really want people to understand the concept of sedentary behavior more than possibly what they do at the moment. And I think the community don't really understand it because the people that are providing the information, the medicos, the allied health professionals, fitness trainers, who are grading what they do, they don't essentially understand it either yet. And I don't, I don't even understand it. I'm working toward it. it to me, it's a, a work in progress. So I really want people to look inside the sedentary concept and realise that it's quite different. Um, its responses are different from exercise itself and they need to combine mm. both together, keep coming back to it, reduce the sedentary time, get fit with your fitness program, marry them together and become a tribe of active exercises. That's my message. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good message. And I think we have all heard that Paul really knows 
the things related to sedentary behavior. And he has this uh, neat fit coaching program for free now for the next three months. So please check out it if you interested. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher podcast. 